Hello and welcome back to another Before You Buy, the video where we talk about a brand new NAS or a data storage device and I give you five reasons why you should think about buying it and five reasons why you might want to sit on the fence. This is the TS410E. We've already done a full hardware review of this. It's about 25 minutes long. Who's got that much time in their lives, right? So this video is a Before You Buy. It's where we talk about the highlights of what we like and what we don't like about this device and hopefully by the end it'll help you decide whether the 410E is suitable for you and your data. Let's go. That is right. This is probably one of the main selling points of this device to a lot of NAS users that have got a very niche attitude to what they want from their data in close proximity in that it is a truly silent NAS. Now, the term silent NAS is something QNAP have thrown around for a while. They've released lots of different devices in their portfolio with the label silent NAS or quiet NAS. And these are devices that are fanless by design. But this device, because it doesn't really utilize mechanical hard drives in most most cases, although it does of course support mechanical hard drives, most users that are going to use it are going to use two and a half inch SATA SSDs inside. And this is a four bay 2.5 inch SATA system that relies on heat dissipation and heat sinks around the entire structure of the system and connection via thermal paste of heat sinks internally and with ventilation panels around, resulting in this system dissipating heat without the use of a mechanical fan. It makes as much noise when it's switched on as it does when it's switched off, which is it going to be tremendously appealing to people that are going to be in incredible close proximity to this device, whether it is interfacing directly by 2.5 GBE or 5 GBE using official adapters, or just having the system in your local area environment for multimedia, a truly silent NAS is going to be very appealing to some users. Next up, yes, this four bay NAS is incredibly compact. I mean, again, it is a little deep and it is metallic and I won't lie, it's quite heavy, but as NASs go, this four bay NAS system is tremendously compact. Just to give you a bit of perspective, the same CPU memory combo inside this is available in this, the QNAP TS453E. Now, this is the size difference between them. Yes, this one's a little taller, but look at the scale difference between them there. Indeed, in terms of depth, if we put them side by side, there's not a tremendous amount of difference around about an inch and a half there. And ultimately, when you compare these two, it's the co the compact nature of it while still remaining fanless, thanks to the use of 2.5 inch storage media, which is again, gonna be very appealing to people working in small, confined editing suites, again, leaning slightly more into that point about noise, but also just the sheer lack of space it's going to occupy. And the system can be deployed both horizontally and vertically. It doesn't make any difference there between the two of them. So again, for those of you looking for a very small NAS, that is gonna be tremendously appealing there. Yes, the CPU. I've already kind of alluded to it in the previous point, but the CPU inside this device is one that we've already seen before in other desktop solutions. There, Despite its compact nature, the CPU inside the Intel J6412 uh, processor there, it's an Intel Celeron quad-core processor at 2.0 gigahertz that can be burst up to 2.6 gigahertz with onboard uh, 10th generation Intel graphics there as well, embedded graphics on board, I think up to 750 or 800 megahertz. This device does have a decent amount of power inside while still remaining efficient. It's no Intel i3 or some high-end Xeon, but at the same time, it doesn't need to be. It isn't like a fully-fledged, huge flash system. It utilizes four drives there. And also, when you compare its internal CPU against other uh, Intel Celerons in the market right now, popular choices being, in the case of QNAP, the N5105, and they're on Laser Store as well. Or if you look at Synology at the time of recording, uh, they are still utilizing the J4125. This CPU stands Backs up very, very well while remaining very uh, powerful enough, while being very, very efficient and with embedded graphics on board. And that combined with eight gig of memory straight out of the box means you've got a decent amount of internal hardware rocking on day one, whether you're gonna be utilizing it for virtual machine, virtual, uh, Plex Media Server, surveillance, uh, multi-tier backups, and multi-user backups as well, all rolled into this device very easily thanks for that internal hardware. 
Which brings us to that word efficiency. Thanks to this device being fanless and being heavily designed around the idea of taking advantage of heat dissipation, both externally and internally, it is a very low power NAS device there. It arrives with an external 90 watt PSU, but you're not gonna utilize that 90 watts all the time. And anyone that's ever utilizing metered power connections or are very conscious of power consumption with the old lecky bills going up a bit high, or maybe you live in a, a mobile home, a motor bus, uh, not a motorboat, uh, a, a long canal boat, or effectively living in a location where you're going to be running through a UPS at all times because you have a power connection that drops from time to time, a more efficient NAS system that still remains very, very competent and powerful is actually a lot harder to find. And most efficient NASs you tend to find arrive with ARM processors or arrive with incredibly modest specifications and a low PSUs is a good indicator of that. This manages to be quite a powerful NAS that can be powerful when it needs to be, but moreover has a greater spectrum of efficiency with that hardware. And for those of you looking at a NAS system, again, silent, compact and power efficient, come on, this is a great little device for all of those things. And finally, onto something to do with the connections on this device. Normally, at this point, I talk about I like that this has got 2.5 GB, and sure, that's good, but we'll get onto that later on. But what I really like is the system arrives with four of those red USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports. That means that this small device, which again is going to be utilizing 2.5 inch SATA media at 12.5 mil height, which means whether you use SSDs or you use traditional hard drives, you can't really go higher than around about 4 TB logically without you know either going into QLC NAN territory or going into uh, very poor performance drives. This means that you're also able to take advantage of much faster external storage. So you can get 1000 megabytes per second USB drives that are USB 3.2 Gen 2 built on M2 SSD technology inside, or you can take advantage of uh, faster performing hubs, faster performing docking stations, take advantage of those larger scale expansion devices from QNAP 2, 4, 8 and 12 bay expansions that are able to take advantage of that broader bandwidth to allow that larger performance speed means you can get this device and have a tremendous amount of scalability and upgradability. I haven't even talked about adapters as well. And you've got 2.5 GBE and 5 gigabit Ethernet adapters that are connected to standard USB 3.2 uh, Gen 1. But once you get a USB 3.2 Gen 2 hub, you can take advantage of more of those and add faster network connections and other faster peripherals too. There's a lot to be getting on with in terms of the architecture of this rather modest system. How Ever. It's not always good, and along with those five great things, there are five things you might want to know about this device that may, may, might make you remain on the fence a little bit longer. That's right, that memory. Now, this system I mentioned earlier on, I'm really glad it arrived with 8 gig of memory. That's a decent amount of RAM to be knocking around with when you're multitasking on day one. But you can't upgrade that memory beyond 8 gig. You can't even get a version of it that's got less than 8 gig. You've got 8 gig of DDR4 3200 uh, megahertz non-ECC memory by default. But if you wanted to scale higher than that to run a few more VMs, to run a bunch more cameras, to multitask a lot of other power applications at the same time, you're not going to be able to get higher than that. And it's particularly galling when you find out that CPU inside is actually capable of supporting up to 32 gig of memory. That 8 gig of memory that's inside can't be upgraded either because it's not a loose sodium slot that you can just pop in a new um, uh, memory module. It is soldered to the board via four individual 2 gig DDR4 cell uh, modules soldered to the board so you can't upgrade them so as good as 8 gig is i don't like that i can't upgrade that memory further in line with what that cpu is capable of this next one is kind of a half and half complaint because i'm going to complain but it has to be said that there is a caveat the complaint is that lack of it being an nvme ssd device now what i mean by that is this is very compact it, you know, it doesn't have a tremendous amount of space, but they've still gone to the trouble of putting four bays inside. But SATA SSDs can only really give you uh, between 350 and 450 megabytes per second on average of transmission. A lot of brands will 
um, highlight that their drives can hit 5, 525, 535 megabytes per second, but you've got to be using very preset sequential data to hit, hit those speeds in un, you know, in non uh, realistic or artificial test scenarios. In most common garden utilization, you're looking at 350, 450 megs per second for an SSD, and you've got four of them in there. An NVMe inside that could have hit thousands of megabytes per second. So the fact this doesn't have M2 SSDs, M2 NVMe for the main slots, or even a couple of M2 slots inside is a real bummer for me. When I know that that device I showed you earlier, which has got the same CPU and the same memory and is a four bay SATA system, has two M2 NVMe slots inside. This doesn't have that. So it doesn't have it as the base storage or as an additional storage. Now, in QNAP's defense, it's worth highlighting that there is an M2 NVMe device that's incredibly similar to this. It's known as the TBS-464. It has got four M2 NVMe SSD slots inside. It has got 2.5 GBE. It's got a quad-core Intel Celeron processor inside. It's even got eight gig of non-upgradable memory. Sound familiar much? But the fact remains that it's not silent because it has an internal fan. It doesn't take advantage of this more efficient CPU and it doesn't have four USB 3.2 Gen 2 slots. So it's not like for like in its appeal. It's a much more compact NAS system in a plastic chassis, not metal all the way along, hence the need for a fan. So I would have liked to have seen this in an M2 NVMe version, or even a U.2 version would have been good as well. And then we could have taken advantage of faster SAS-based SSDs as well. You probably would have needed to rein in a little bit on the features and functionality, thanks to that CPU and the available PCI lanes, but still it would have been a lot more advantageous. And I think for a compact device of this nature, it would have been a real shame to not have that tremendous scalability in its performance of the SSDs rather than sticking with SATA on day dot. And this is another area where I think you do, uh, well not you, but some users may be bottlenecked in the what they were hoping this device can do. And that is that it arrives with those 2.5 GBE slots, which is great, and two of them which you can lag for 5 GBE. But again, even if you play devil's advocate and say you only get about 350 megs at the low end from these SSDs, that means one of these is going to oversaturate one of those 2.5 GBE ports. The minute you introduce four of these in a RAID 0 or RAID 5, that performance, you're never going to be able to hit that full available throughput externally via two times 2.5 GBE slots. And yes, you can add 5 GBE with an adapter, which is great, but even then I don't feel like I'm getting the full bandwidth out of those drives externally this device should have had a 10 gigabit ethernet port by default particularly when qnap went to such lengths during its early uh, preview of this device as a gamer focused nas with gamer focused routers arriving with 10 gbe from qnap's own range netgear and more as and d-link as well we've talked about the d-link switches previously as well this device should have had 10 gigabit ethernet it's QNAP have released in the past in the form of the HS453DX, a four bay, two hard drive, two SSD NAS system that had a Celeron processor and 10 gigabit ethernet. And that was in 2018, 19. We're in 2022. This doesn't have 10 GBE and that's a real shame for some users, me included. The price tag, it's a little more expensive than I would have assumed. Now, the newer generation of releases that have got that CPU, and that's right, I don't know why I keep taking this off the table, I might as well leave it there. Um, this series of devices that have got that J641, uh, J6412 processor there, I just feel like the price tag for them, yes, it's a new CPU, so presumably QNAP have had to factor in the price of that and the rising costs of hardware during hardware shortages and post-pandemic supply chain and semiconductor shortages, there's so many factors there where we can kind of give them a bit of leeway in the pricing, but still nonetheless, this device, much like this device at launch, has a weird pricing right now. I've seen this device listed at 599, 699, 799 in some places, and there's real fluctuating price points for it right now. And even at its lowest price point, let's go with that 599 price point in dollars, that's all right. But given its hardware architecture 
isn't, you know, as extensive as this, the 464 here, which has a PCIe upgrade slot there, which has got M2 NVMe upgrade slots in there as well. And this has got a Celeron quad core four by two times 2.5 GBE and USB 3.2 Gen 2. This device, why is this device seemingly cheaper than this one? Yes, it's a silent NAS, and yes, it's SSD focused, so there's an argument that, you know, specialized design and being a bit more niche, but the price point shouldn't be that much higher in some locations. Now, this point may peter out. In the future, the price may, may be more stabilized as more hardware becomes available, but right now, at the time of recording, the price point of the TS410e is not as good as it could be. And of course, we've got to talk about it ransomware. Uh, 2022 has been a real humbling year for QNAP in terms of uh, being hit by uh, the ransomware known as Deadbolt, by the Deadbolt Group. Uh, 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 a vulnerability found within a uh, photo station of their applications and uh, an early Linux kernel of their software was able to be taken advantage of by um, uh, this external uh, group and ransomware uh, it was a lot of users were hit by this ransomware attack in which uh, code was injected remotely into the device that ordered the data inside the system to be encrypted, uh, a passkey created and destroyed, and a ransomware note be left for users to have to pay somewhere in the region of 500 to a grand, depending on your local currency, to get that encryption key back and unlock all of your data again. And again, this has been a persistent story chasing QNAP throughout 2022. Now, maybe you're watching this in the future, and that was the end of it. But it has to be said that this has still been a concern for many users, and I think it would be remiss not to look at a QNAP solution in 2022 and at least not check into the state of play when it comes to security. Now, in QNAP's defense, they are not the only brand that's been hit by ransomware. They're not even the only brand in NAS. If you look at NAS, every single brand, WD, Synology, Acer Store, TerraMaster, they've all been hit by ransomware over the years. They're not, you know, in, no one's invulnerable. And when you move outside of NAS, the concept of vulnerabilities in software as a software update comes out and then the hackers find a vulnerability and then it gets packed. This is, this carries on this cat and mouse game every single day of every week of every month of every year. And it's about us staying on top of our updates and staying on top of our security settings. But still nonetheless, I think it would be remiss not to at least acknowledge that QNAP seems to have been quite a hot target for these companies in 2022. And hopefully this is a subject that is going to be, the book is going to be closed on it uh, going into 2023, fingers crossed. But this has been five reasons why you should buy the new QNAP Silent NAS TS410E and five reasons why you might want to remain on the fence a little bit longer. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments if you did. Click like. If you did, click subscribe if you want to learn more about this device and other network and data storage uh, subjects as we talk about them throughout this year and the next. And of course, take advantage of the free advice section over on NAS Compares via uh, the link to the free advice section below and on Ask NAS Compares the Community Forum. There should be a review for this device linked below as well. It should have already gone out live, fingers crossed. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.